Welcome back to Dave's Gong By, and really excited to be talking to uh, the guest that we have on the program this morning. This is someone that I've been listening to, that we've all been listening to for several decades now. And if you want to go back, yes, all the way to the mid-1970s, when Dr. Demento was playing Dead Skunk on the radio, sure, you can go back to that. You can also go to the 70s and 80s, when Loudon Wainwright III was releasing these marvelous albums of material, of in, in the folk and the folk rock mode, personal songs, also amusing and humorous songs. You can go back to just a few years ago, when he did that terrific soundtrack for Knocked Up, and, and uh, I think another high point in a career kind of full of them. And now, Mountain Wainwright returns one more time with a new album called Older Than My Old Man Now. Talk about personal songs and, uh, and reaching deep for some of them. So the main thing is I want to welcome Loudon Wainwright III to the neighborhood and also to Denver since he'll be playing in town tonight at the Ellie Calkins Opera House at the Denver Center. So welcome to Colorado and welcome to the neighborhood, Loudon Wainwright. Uh, uh, nice to talk to you, Dave. Good, good. Um, so I, I, let, let, me, let me ask first of all about since the music business is so different from what it used to be in some ways, when you feel that you have an album ready, I mean, do you have a deadline from the record company, or do you just sort of say, okay, I've cobbled together certain album, uh, certain songs on a theme, I'm ready to go to a studio? How does it work for you these days? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any deadlines from, from record labels. I'm not signed to any particular label. Uh, my last... Uh, uh, couple of records have been put out by a, a small label called Second Story in New York that a friend of mine runs. So really, uh, I, I get to gather the songs together when I think uh, there's, a, there's a group of, of 12 or 13, maybe 15 songs that fit together um, uh, in terms of tone and mood and theme, and then I uh, figure out how to pay for it and, uh, and make a record. That's how it goes now. And is it um, the case, as it is with some musicians, that the the career, the paying the bills, is from touring and not so much the actual physical recording or, or the iTunes stuff? Yeah, that's been, my, that's been the case with my career from the beginning, really. I mean, despite the fact that I was on major labels in the 70s and, and into the 80s, um, and did have the aforementioned uh, radio single Dead Skunk. I, I I never really have made money from record sales. I've always pretty much made the, the made my nut with the uh, with the touring and the performing live. Do you miss anything about the old days of Columbia and having that, or is it so much better in so many ways? Essentially, being your own boss and doing mainly what you want to do. Well, it's always nice to to, 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 do, to do what you want to do. I mean, I, I, I was never made to really do anything I didn't want to do. Hmm. And there are some advantages uh, to be signed, to, I guess, to, to a major label. But uh, I, I'm lucky in that, uh, you know, I, can, I continue to make records. And uh, you mentioned my most recent one, Older Than My Old Man Now. And, um, you know, again, uh, get them out there and... Uh, enjoy making them and hopefully people like them so I, I, I'm keeping going as it were now do you remember when that kind of moment hit you because you did um, lose your dad a while ago and, and your mom you went through a, a very difficult period when you lost your mom you put in uh, last man on earth uh, when you were going through that was there this day that you woke up and you said oh my god you know I've outlived my dad and well, then, I knew the day was coming. I, my yeah. father died in uh, in December of uh, of 1988, at uh, a relatively young age of, of 63. So as I approached and then passed my 63rd birthday, uh, yeah, yes, I, I um, it hit me, or it hit me before I got to my 63rd birthday. Um, that was a couple of years ago, too. But so, you know, this idea of... Um, Outliving your parents is a kind of powerful one, at least to me it was. And I, I, I kind of the, the whole album is uh, is is about you know dealing a bit with mortality and um, death and decay, my favorite <laughs> topic. 
Hi, folks. It's Loudon Wainwright. Hey, you're listening to Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Well, it is kind of, I mean, if you think about it, everybody thought back when Bob Dylan did Time Out of Mind, that was his death album, his mortality album, and he was having some medical issues at the time, and we all thought, oh my God, is this it? And then it's been 15 years later, he's released four more albums with probably many more to come. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're looking in the mirror and you know, with a six-month prognosis. I mean, have you moved on to other things? <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm writing other songs and, and you know continuing. Uh, um, I, I uh, with, with with any luck, I'll I'll put out some more albums or at least another album. At, at least one more, certainly. Um, do um. Here, here's I guess the question: since all throughout your career, a lot of your songs are autobiographical and personal, is it uh, is it too easy to say that it's cathartic to do that? Does it actually help? Does it actually make you feel better? Or you do it? But the problems and the pain and whatever's still there. I don't think it's therapeutic or, or cathartic. I mean, it's cathartic for me to perform, mm. to, to sing the songs uh, for people, and, and hopefully it's uh, you know they get something out of it, some kind of release or catharsis. But uh, in terms of uh, does it solve my you know neuroses or, or uh, you know. I don't think it does. In fact, it could be argued that it exacerbates things. But it, 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 it also solves another problem for me, which is, you know, it's, it's my job. It's what I do for a living, writing songs and then taking them out and singing for people. So, um, and it's a job that I like and appreciate, so I'm, I'm happy to have it. Yeah, I mean, and you never know sort of the effect that um, the songs will be on those hundred or three hundred or five hundred people or thousand people that you're singing Sometimes for. Sometimes you find out. I mean, people at the end of my shows, you know, I'm the, quite often I'll set up a little table and sell people my CD and, and meet them and say hello. And people do say that, you know, certain songs have had some kind of effect on them or, or amused them or uh, helped them in some way little way so so it's nice to, to, to know that uh, some of it's sticking to the proverbial wall yeah I mean I even little things I remember seeing you at the bottom line probably good lord 20 years the bottom line doesn't exist anymore it was a club in in Manhattan for people who don't know but I remember seeing you there and you were singing uh, the song Westchester County which I had not heard yet on album and you mentioned you lit Long Island and yeah, I jumped out of my skin because I'd been living there for 30 years. And nobody, I mean, people write songs about Los Angeles, and they mention New York and maybe Chicago. But to hear you at Long Island in a song, you know, <laughs> I don't think I jumped out of my chair, but I was like, oh my God, you know, at that, that little recognition moment, which I thought I'd just tell you that. I don't know why. Just wanted to share that with you. We're talking with um, Mountain Wainwright III, and we're talking about his songs and his autobiographical songs and the, the way that you do stuff. Um, you've also done, and, and these are kind of fun, um, topical numbers. You did, did a whole album, as a matter of fact, very good one, of songs that were more about issues in the news and stuff. Do you, are, are those kind of easier to write or just as difficult? Uh, they're not easier, uh, but they're not. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think of writing songs as as being difficult in general. I mean, it's it's a, it's a process, and it uh, when it's going properly, it it, it, it goes fine. It's not a. Uh, it's not hard for me to write songs. Uh, um, the, the the topical songs, um, social commentary songs. I've been writing those uh, for over forty years, and continue to do so. Um, and they're not really any different from from the more personal material. They're they're, they're songs designed to uh, you know affect an audience. And um, so I just think of they're all just a bunch of songs to me. Some of them are novelty songs. Some of them are really serious uh, songs about family issues. Others are topical songs. They're just songs, so really yeah. all fruit, so to speak. I mean, uh, Tom Paxton, who who was on my show a few years ago, he calls them short shelf life songs, the ones that he does very often in concert. And I think that's kind of a misnomer because they last in some ways as long. If, if the, um, the crux of the theme of what you're trying to say in the song is relevant, it doesn't matter if the particular issue that you're pointing to in the newspapers is no longer current. You know, a song's a song and it can last for a whole bunch of different reasons. Or at least yeah, that, yeah, my true. personal thought about that. Um, can I ask, uh, uh, if people, again, if they weren't 
alive back when I was and listening to Dead Skunk on Dr. Demento and some of your early albums. Um, did having your music on the soundtrack for Knocked Up and that, that wonderful album that you did, Strange Weirdos, did that kind of do for you and the public what, say, um, something about Mary did for Jonathan Richmond? Did it put you, put you back up in a certain way? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was, a, it was a fun experience to work on that. It was a big movie, Knocked Up. Uh, I also had a little acting role in the movie. Um, and the music was done by myself and my friend Joe Henry, uh, who's a great uh, producer and songwriter himself in Los Angeles. So the whole experience was was fun. Uh, I, I don't know if it put me on the map any more than I already am, but um, uh, the song, uh, interestingly enough, the song that most people remember from that album and that movie is the song that I, that's at the end, the song called Daughter. Right. Which, uh, and, and, and people are always asking me to do that song. And, and, and it's, funnily enough, I didn't write it. A friend of mine called Peter Blakevad wrote it. I recorded it, but... Um, so that that was the big um, the big news on Knocked Up is that the, the big song was the song I didn't write. Oh well, sorry. I mean, it's a terrific song, and it's it's. I'm um, you know, you read the commentary about it on YouTube, and people are it's the song people are putting in weddings now when yeah. fathers are giving their daughters away. There's a, that's the song, you know, it makes me cry and stuff. So sorry, I'm kind of sorry you didn't write it, um, <laughs> but I, I guess we both get me royalties. Too. Me so. too. But I, I, I might as well admit I didn't write it, and I'm very pleased that my friend Peter Blakefad, who who is a wonderful songwriter, that not enough people know about um, made some money on that and uh, people should definitely go and check out his other work because he's got you know, lots of great songs cast moving all the way back but still in the autobiographical mode I never realized that um, one of the songs on Attempted Mustache that was, was called Liza was actually about Liza Minnelli with whom you went to school that's right. I was in grammar school. Uh, this is years and years ago in, in Los Angeles. My, we, our, our family lived out there in the uh, in the early and mid '50s, and I went to a school called Warner Avenue School, which is in Westwood, the, uh, the suburb of Los Angeles, or where UCLA is. And um, in my uh, class and second and third grade was Liza Minnelli. Um, I knew who she, I certainly knew who her mother was because I, I had uh, seen, like most everybody else, The Wizard of Oz. Right. And um, I went over to her house and had what, what I guess are now called play dates and actually uh, met and saw her mother on a couple of occasions. Good Lord. Did they seem normal in the home context? Yeah, pretty pretty normal. I mean, you know, uh, we were seven and eight years. Yeah, okay. Old. I, I don't, I don't, you know, every, everything is. Uh, I, I was excited to meet her mother because, again, she was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Right. But um, yeah, that's true. I did to hang out with Liza all those many many years ago. Over over uh, well over fifty, more like sixty years. Years ago, and, and, and there's that weird connection because I think your father had gone to see her in her famous one of her famous concerts and then your son ended up doing her Carnegie Hall concert the, too the, the Judy Garland Carnegie Hall concert yeah yeah so there's this weird Garland-esque Manelli-esque connection running through the whole stream of your family how how interesting I guess mm. <laughs> and, 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 and even more kind of oddly interesting another thing I picked up either from wiki or somewhere else was that at one point uh, you, you were going through a psychiatrist, maybe you still are, but at one time it was your dad's shrink? Was that odd in some uh, ways? Yeah, I did sell my father's, uh, one of my, uh, my father's shrink at some point. It was basically to get a letter to get out of the army. Oh, good for you. <laughs> it was nice of him to, to, to let you do that. Were you a, a full-fledged kind of hippie or too post-cynical for that? No, I, I was the San Francisco in the summer of love and had a good time that, that summer and um, had fun and grew my hair and got busted for pot and, you know. And I think, did they make you cut your hair or it was sort yes, of... Yes, they did. I wrote a yeah. song about it called Samson and the Warden. My, uh, I was 
prison. I was uh, in, in a jail in Oklahoma City for five days for possession of uh, marijuana and I uh, received a haircut. Hmm. Were you abused in any other way or was it you know, just no, born? Unfortunately, I wasn't. My father uh, uh, bailed me out uh, just in time, I'd say, because it was, you know, I was 22 and uh, very cute. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, yeah, then you grew your hair back with a vengeance, and you had that for, for several years. Um, we're talking, by the way, to Loudon Wainwright III. He's going to be in Denver at the Denver Center this Saturday, uh, the 19th, at the Ellie Calkins Opera House. Also, Lee, I should mention Leo Kotke yes, is, is on the bill. Definitely Leo, mention Leo Kotke. Um, so I just did. And, by the way, for our New York listeners, uh, Mr. Wainwright will be at Zankel Hall in the one and only aforementioned Carnegie Hall. That is next Saturday, January 26th. Um, I'm wondering, since that, you know, as you mentioned, a good chunk of what you do as a career for a profession is touring, has it gotten harder as it gets older? Is it, is it a drag, or is it still the most fun thing you do? Well, the traveling is not fun. Mm. Uh, it, it is a drag, but the, you know it's still fun to get there and go out on stage for seventy-five minutes and sing songs and, and uh, you know entertain people. That that is something that I've always loved and continue to love. But uh, dragging my butt through the airport is is uh, is uh, you know right hasn't been hasn't been fun in years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Latin Wainwright, let's talk about sex. If, if you don't mind for a moment, because that is also a theme that runs through your new album, Older Than My Old Man Now. There's a very funny duet that you have with... Well, first of all, how on earth did you connect with Dame Edna? Um, well, Dame Edna, also known in real life as, as the aus wonderful Australian... Uh, Comedian Barry Humphreys. Icon, yeah. an actor and, and, and writer and painter and great guy. His, his, his real name is Barry Humphreys. Mm -hmm created the character of Dame Edna Everidge. Um, and we met on, a, on, a, on a, an acting job. Uh, we were both in, a, in a, actually we, we played love interests in, in a couple of episodes of Ally McBeal uh, some years ago. Now it's probably 10 years ago. And uh, I, I was a huge fan of Barry's work and um, still am and, and you know, um, played in some of my songs, uh, one of which was this song that I had written called I Remember Sex. And then when it came time to, uh, to make this record, uh, Older Than My Old Man, which includes that song, I got in touch with him and asked him if he would duet with me on the record, which he agreed to do, and it's, uh, it's a thrill. Uh, a lot, the record has a lot of duets. There's a, there's a, there's a duet with Ramblin' Jack Elliott, who was one of my, my big idols, and a, and a contemporary of mine called... Uh, Chris Smither. Oh, yeah. He, he was on the show a few years ago, too. Yeah. My son Rufus and I sing a song together. <clears throat> and the, well, in fact, all my kids are on the record. So, But the, the Barry, Barry Humphreys, Dame Edna thing was a very magical. Oh, Loudon, what memories. How true is that? I mean, you, you are married for a third time. So I assume you're getting some. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well, I mean, well, that's the thing. I mean, uh, yes, uh, the cliche is as you get older, blah, blah, you're not that interested, or physically, blah, 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 or, you know, or are there still temptations of being on the road a lot? I mean, is there a, a, an understanding that you have with your third wife that you certainly didn't have maybe with, with uh, Kate McGarrigal? I mean, how does the that... understanding is the same with all the wives, which is don't you dare do that. Oh. <laughs> okay, but but on this third one, have you listened? Is it, you know, are you a good boy, as it were? Dave, you're getting a little personal now. Well, so is your album. That's <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I won't go anywhere where you don't want to go, but your your songs go there, and your album is kind of going there, so it's, it's a natural question to ask. Well, you can just play the songs. How about that? Okay, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But but then that also brings back to the questions of answering your family all those years with your songs. Um, you know, which, which, as you said earlier, was sometimes good and sometimes bad, of, of the fact that you were communicating with your kids and sometimes with your wives uh, in music, which was fine. When, when did I say that? Not in this interview. 
No, well, maybe not. Well, some of the, the other stuff that you read, or I've read about you, there was a big piece in Vanity Fair. Well, you've been Fair. on the web, have you, have you, Dave? Vanity Web, Vanity Fair, indeed. Yes, Very long yes, piece. yes, yes, yes. You're, yes. you're, 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 uh, you're, doing, uh, you're doing your research. Are doing you? the math. Yes, I am. So let's just, let's, just, let's just talk about now and the here and the now. Well, okay. The, well, I sort of was. I was. I was kind of asking. Um, you're. You are married. Um, are, are you? St- you're raising um, a young person. How does it feel to still be a dad, dad, even at this stage of your life, as opposed to having kids old and grown? Well, uh, my youngest daughter is, is, is a sophomore in college, and she she. So 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 actually, it's it's me and my wife and my, our dog now. Oh, cool. So the lead pipe sitch. <laughs> Wait, that's that's the name of the dog. I missed that. The lead pipe cinch. You've never heard that expression before? Oh no, no, I have not. What does it mean? Look it up on the web, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. Well, let me ask. Do you feel like a a mellower, nicer person than you used to be? No, I'm much I'm, I'm much more cranky and unpleasant than I used to be. Now, are you joking, or do you really feel that, or in the middle? <laughs> no, I, I feel that. I feel that. In fact, well, we're going to have to stop soon. Sure. We're getting so cranky. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I know you only have a, a couple minutes left, I, but I do want to. Right. Um, right. Well, no, but, but, let's see. Let's see. Let me roll through the bunch of these of these questions that I uh, asked. Um, how much acting are you doing and continuing to do? Because that's become more and more of your itinerary for the past ten years or so as well. Um, occasionally I get an acting job, which is fun, you know. Um, I, uh, am in a movie called, uh, Sleepwalk With Me, which is out now. And That's Mike Birbiglia, that, right? Yeah. What? That's the Mike Birbiglia. That's right. Okay. And, uh, I did an episode of, uh, Person of Interest, played a sheriff from Texas a couple of, uh, about a month ago. So, you know, I'm out and about. And I guess our last question, because I can feel you itching to hang up the phone, so I, I will ask one last question to Loudon Wainwright III. Um, and again, it's about the songwriting the, um, and telling your life story in three or four minute bits. But you've until now resisted the urge to write an autobiography, as had Dylan, as had Neil Young and some other folks. Now they're reneging on that and very happily writing their life stories. Do you see that happening? Um, I don't know. I don't really see a need for that. I mean, uh, I, I just, I'm just focusing on the songs. Cool. Well, it's been, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a pleasure focusing on your music and your life and the songs of Loudon Wainwright III. Everybody make sure to see him tonight at the Denver Center with Leo Kotke, also, of course, on the bill, and then next Saturday at Carnegie Hall on January 26th. Mr. Wainwright, it really, you know, I'm sorry if I, I pushed a few envelopes that you didn't really want to open up, but it has been really nice to talk to you and very glad to have you in the neighborhood. All right. Good talking to you, Dave.